what's up? Growing up with a single mom, I ate a lot of Stouffer's frozen chicken pot pies. Even back then, I was always super suspect as to why the product on my plate in no way delivered on the promise of the picture that was on the box. So today, I'm gonna show you how to make the opposite of a Stouffer's by using some classic techniques to make a fully from scratch version that's probably the best I've ever had. To get started, I'm gonna need a whole chicken. This one's about three to four pounds, and to get it ready to cook, I'm gonna generously season it up with the B-Man's signature fotisserie style slow cooked chicken dry brine. To make that into a container, I'll measure 15 grams of salt, five grams of sugar, three grams of poultry seasoning, five grams of garlic powder, and five grams of black pepper. Shake it all up, and that's it. Poultry seasoning is an underutilized ingredient, in my opinion, and when it's combined with everything else in this dry brine, it makes chicken taste very, very good. You don't need to get 100% of this dry brine onto the chicken, but try and get it evenly coated like this. And once it's all rubbed up, I'm gonna move this over to my fridge to cure for as little as 12 hours, but preferably 24. Now, while that cures, it's time to make some very flavorful chicken stock. For that, I've got a bunch of chicken bones here, specifically three packs of chicken backs, or about two kilos worth, and one pack of chicken feet, about one and a half kilos of those. Chicken feet are the secret to pro-level chicken stock, full stop. Reason being is they're full of gelatin, and that melts into the water, bringing a ton of body, viscosity, and richness to the stock that you can't get from just bones. Once these are all laid out on a sheet tray, I'm gonna load them into a 450F 230C oven and roast them for 25 to 30 minutes. Roasting the bones really, really opens up their chickeny flavor, and in my opinion, chicken stock made from bones that aren't roasted just is much less good. After 25 minutes in the oven, I'm going to pull these out, and when we take a closer look, you can see that they're not hard roasted, just enough to make them more flavorful. We're not trying to make a brown chicken stock here, we just want one that's full of roasty chicken flavor. Now, I'm going to scoop this whole tray into my Instant Pot, then hit that sheet tray with some water and scrape up the roasty bits of fond stuck to the pan. I'll dump that in, and then in three kilos, of water and set up this instant pot to cook on slow for about eight hours. The next morning, or the day I want to eat the world's best chicken pot pie, I'll come back to my slow cooker and pop off the lid. As you can see, the bones are basically disintegrated in here and they've given me every last bit of their chickeny essence. If you wanted to save time and pressure cook this stock instead of slow cook it, I'd say you could try it, but keep in mind that pressure cooking stock tends to emulsify some of the chicken fat into it, and that doesn't taste good in my opinion, so I prefer the long, gentle slow cooker method. Once this is strained off, I'm going to throw it in the fridge to cool down for later on. And while I'm over there, I'm going to grab my dry brine chicken. As you can see, the skin has gotten nice and tight and the seasonings look pretty well adhered to the skin. I've preheated my oven to 285F 140C and I'm going to load in this bird to slow roast for two and a half to three hours. Later on, when I come back to check on this bird, you can see that the skin is fully rendered and it's taken on some nice golden color. The main benefit of slow roasting a bird like this is supremely juicy flesh. My main issue with most store-bought rotisserie chicken, which you can use as a sub for this recipe by the way, is that it's mostly dry. The leg meat can be okay, but the breast meat is usually overcooked and pretty chalky. Now to determine doneness, I'm gonna temp the leg. It's about 175F, the breast is about 165, and that's much higher than I would normally go temp-wise, but since we dry brined and then slow roasted this bird, it's still gonna be super juicy, and you'll see later on. For now, I'm gonna set this bird aside to fully rest for about 30 minutes or so, and in the meantime, I'm gonna sort out the vegetables for the pot pie. As far as veggies go, I've got the absolute classics of onion, garlic, celery, carrot, and potatoes, specifically Yukon Gold. As you can see, I've given all of these veggies a medium dice, except for the garlic, I minced that. But if you're feeling fancy, and today of course I am, there's some additional aromatic vegetables that are gonna be worth including. That's leeks and fennel. Leeks bring a soft, grassy onion flavor that's pretty pro, and fennel brings a pretty light, anisey sweetness to anything that it touches. Leave them out if you want, or be a fancy boy like me and throw them in there. Once the vegetables are sorted out, it's time to make the pie part of this pot pie. For that, into the jar of my food processor, I'm gonna measure 400 grams of all-purpose flour, eight grams of salt, and 170 grams of butter. I've sliced this stuff thin so that it breaks down more evenly. The lid goes on, and I'll spin this for about 15 seconds or so, or until the butter and flour combine into a pebbly-looking mess like this. Then from there, I'm going to grab two things that make this dough a lot richer and easier to roll out. That's 85 grams of sour cream and one large egg. Oops. 
In they go. The lid goes on and it'll spin until everything comes together into a proper golden colored dough like this for about 25 to 30 seconds. Already, you can see that the egg and sour cream in this pie crust makes it way more malleable and workable than just a straight butter crusted dough. Now I'll flip this out onto my cutting board and give it a light kneading for about 15 seconds or so. I'm just looking to bring things together into a cohesive mass. I'm not looking to develop any gluten at this point, so be careful. Once it's well combined like this, I'm gonna wrap it with plastic wrap and then put it in the fridge to hydrate and firm up for about 20 minutes while I thank the sponsor of this video, Geology. Geology is a men's skincare company that creates a simple, effective skincare routine customized just for you. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but I have adult acne and it sucks like a lot, especially when you're on camera for a living. So I went to geology.com and took their 30 second quiz to let them know about what my current skincare regimen is and how it's working. As you can see, it's not working like it all. So after taking the quiz with Geology, they paired me up with regimen number 17, which is a face wash, a night cream, and a morning cream. All three of these products have a set of active ingredients that are simple and proven by science to be effective. For example, the night cream has retinol, hyaluronic acid, and niacinamide in it, all things that an actual dermatologist would prescribe you if you had acne. I just started using Geology and already the inflammation in my skin is down and I'm no longer peeling on a daily basis. So that really feels like a win to me. So to start the new year with a new skin routine designed for you by Geology. Click the link in my description and take your free 30 second quiz and you'll get 50% off your first trial set and then 22% off your lifetime subscription. Again, the link is in my description, 50% off your trial. Thank you, Geology. Okay, now let's cook some vegetables. For that, I'm gonna grab my six and a half quart Dutch oven and preheat it over medium high heat. Once that's hot, in goes a whole stick or 113 grams exactly of butter, then 225 grams of onion, 10 grams of garlic, 115 grams celery, 115 grams carrot, 75 grams of leek, and 75 grams of fennel. I'll follow the veggies with a strong pinch of salt and then stir everything to combine. From there, I'm gonna let these veggies sweat for about five to six minutes to release their moisture and to soften them slightly. At that point, I'm gonna add in my Yukon Gold potatoes, that's about 200 50 grams all day. And I'll mention that I added these potatoes after the other veggies because I found that the potatoes were sticking to the bottom of the pot when I added them with everything else. Once the potatoes are stirred in, we're gonna sweat this down for another three to four minutes to continue softening everything up. Now to make the roux part of this pot pie, I'm gonna add in 115 grams of all-purpose flour and then immediately stir that in. Pretty quickly, that flour is gonna glaze up the bottom of the pot and that can brown pretty easily. I definitely don't want that, so it's very important to stir a lot during this period. After two to three minutes, that raw edge in the flour should be cooked off, so I'm gonna add in 150 grams of dry sherry wine. Even dry sherry is a touch sweet, so I really like it for such a creamy, savory dish. Plus, I really like that nutty, fruity flavor that it brings. If you don't have a bottle of dry sherry on hand, I totally get it. I would say use white wine instead. Once the roux has absorbed the sherry and it's had about a minute or so to cook off the alcohol, in goes 900 grams of my chilled homemade chicken foot stock. It's a lot less appetizing looking when cold, I'll admit that, but look at that texture. It's kind of ploppy and almost like pudding. That's great. That's the gelatin from the feet right there. And that brings the extra body that I was talking about earlier. This allows us to use less roux so that in the end, our pot pie filling is a lot less gloppy. Once everything's stirred to combine, I'm gonna reduce the heat to medium low because scorching with liquid this thick is a very real threat and lower heat is much safer. Once this liquid is up to a gentle simmer like this, I'm gonna cover with the lid and cook until the potatoes are tender for about 15 to 20 minutes. While that cooks, I'm gonna grab my pie crust out of the fridge, unwrap it, and then cut off a 125 gram size piece. Next, I'm gonna squeeze and roll this dough into a little ball in the palms of my hands. My body heat's gonna warm up the butter a little bit, making it more pliable, and that little bit of kneading that I'm doing is gonna make it less crumbly and a lot easier to roll flat. Once I've got this dough rolled into a little round like this, I'm gonna sprinkle it with flour and then press it flat with a plate. This gives us a head start and cuts out a little bit of the rolling part. Now, using a rolling pin, I'm gonna roll this out until it's about an eighth inch thick, give or take. If you're new to pie crust, don't be intimidated by this one. This dough is super easy to roll out and we definitely don't need things to be perfectly round. Once I've got this rolled into a very rugged looking circle, and I think it's generous to call that a circle, I'm gonna grab my vessel. I got these big dog 14 ounce ramekins that work really well for personal sized chicken pot pies off the internet. And I'm really happy with the result. I'll link to them in the description below. As you can see, to get a clean circle here, I'm tracing around the ramekin, leaving about a one inch buffer. That way I get something that's gonna hang over the edges that I can crimp. Thickness wise, hopefully we're somewhere in the ballpark of just over eighth of an inch, just under a quarter of an inch. 
somewhere in there, give or take. Back of the stove, it's been about 20 minutes. The base is thickened up. The veggies are nice and tender, and it's time to check on the potatoes. It's kind of tricky to isolate one of these with a the spoon, but once I've got it pinned up against the side of the pot, as you can see, it smashes with ease, so I know they're done. Lastly, in goes 140 grams of frozen peas and 650 grams or all of the chicken meat that I slow cooked earlier. To get the chicken to this point, I let it rest for 30 to 40 minutes. Then I pulled all of the meat off the carcass, combining the leg and the breast. The bones and the skin will make excellent future chicken stock, so I locked them up in a freezer bag and threw them into the box. If you haven't made your stock for the pot pie yet, throw this stuff in with the feet and the back, and you will be so, 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 so stoked that you did it. Check the meat though, it's juicy as hell. And if you're thinking that that thigh meat is undercooked because it's a little bit pink, it's not. That's just what happens when you cook it super gently and rest it fully. Hey Lauren, you gotta come try this breast meat. This almost like thigh status right That's there. That's what I'm saying, dude. <laughs> All right. Okay, once the chicken and peas are stirred in, it's time to make sure that this pot of filling is seasoned to its full potential. To do that, I'll give it a thoughtful taste. Of course, it still needs more salt. So two strong pinches, I'll give it some black pepper. The lid is on there though, Bri. There you go. More black pepper, then I'll scoot in one gram or so of fresh thyme leaves that I've minced. Stir that in, and then one more taste to confirm that this is the best tasting chicken pot pie filling in history. And it's dope. Now to build one of these pot pies, I'm gonna fill my 14 ouncer most of the way full. This is probably a little bit too full in hindsight. Then to make sure that the crust sticks to the top, I'm gonna to egg wash the rim and then the sides of the rim. This egg wash is just one egg and a little bit of cream, by the way. Next, I'm gonna drop down my pie crust and then pinch it all the way around on the edges to seal it onto the ramekin. This crust should be just a little bit more on the room temperature side because if it's too cold and not malleable enough, it might crack, so just keep that in mind. Once it's all sealed up, I'm gonna make two slits on the top so that steam can escape and then then I'm gonna wash the entire top liberally with my egg wash. This brush is kind of a piece of shit, so I usually end up just going with my fingers and rubbing the egg wash all over the crust to make sure that it's well moistened. And there we go. Now I'm gonna move this over to a sheet tray so that if it decides to bubble over, it won't go onto my oven floor and smoke up my house. Into the oven it goes. This was preheated to 400F 205C. I'm gonna bake this for roughly 25 minutes. Cut to the time lapse. I don't have much to say about this other than that it looks cool and some stuff came out of the top. I wasn't expecting that. After 25 minutes in the oven, the crust on top is really well browned and it's time to pull out. This pie needs to rest for at least 10 minutes before I eat it. So quickly, let me address the other main option for topping. I'm talking about store-bought puff pastry, of course. There's no shame in taking this approach because it's far easier than making and rolling your own pie crust. But for me, it just doesn't hit right. I wish it did because it's very easy to just pull out of a box and press onto a ramekin. And when it comes out of the oven, it looks so dynamic and amazing. But in the end, the texture is just too soft, so I'm not really the biggest fan. It's like good, but it's soft. It's like all soft. Now, back at the actual pie version of this chicken pot pie, it's been resting for about 10 to 15 minutes, and now it's time to crack it open. Personally, I prefer to smash the entire thing all at once so that some pieces are fresh and crispy in the first few bites, and that by the end of the bowl, there's some sogged up biscuity stuff in there that's just completely saturated with chicken gravy. You guys, this pot pie is buttery and creamy, but it's not heavy, and it is so chickeny. I really hope that you see that the little bit of extra work was really worth it. And for everybody like me who grew up eating Stofers, I hope you get stoked on this one and I hope you give it a try soon. Let's eat this thing. Mm -hmm.